Today, we're going to be talking about UX audits. Uh, really, there's like three things that I want everyone to take away from this talk is uh, when do you execute UX audits? How do you go about doing them? Um, and what do you include when reporting back to your stakeholders? First, a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Billy Sweetman. I'm head of design here at Headway. Um, I love design. I love doing design at work. I love doing design at home. I love getting outside, spending time with my wife and kids, uh, creating a ton of stuff and, and teaching folks about design. I help run our design team and really develop a lot of the processes we use on our various uh, projects here at Headway. Um, and this is a big part of our process is going through UX audits. The first question though, before we even talk about how we do UX audits is like, why are we skipping them? And a lot of it can be summarized, you know, that like, we're just busy folks. Company might be growing super fast, which if it is, congratulations. Might have lots of features to ship, you know, busy backlog. We got a ton of stuff on our roadmap going through. Might have a limited team. Team's not that big, wearing a lot of hats. Maybe not enough time to get things done because of all the features that we need to ship or a lot of bugs that are just keeping us busy as we're fixing those things. Or we've never thought about doing one or have needed to do one. We just don't have the experience to really build out a repeatable process for committing to auditing. You know, and you also might be asking yourself, are they really important? You know, do I, should I be doing these things? Um, not having audits part of your process can really weigh down your product in a variety of different ways. You might find out like key metrics and goals aren't converting the way we think they are. Um, and there might be hidden things that were just not being revealed because of that. That could be causing frustration with our customers. They might be frustrated moving through our product. Things are moving all over the place. They don't know why a thing isn't showing up or functioning the way they expect it to. And we would be creating a lot of slower velocity for our developers because we're asking them to maybe build things, duplicate patterns, styles, and things that already exist somewhere else in the app. And we're not leveraging that reusability as we go forward. So outside of that, you know, what are some of the benefits for having an audit process in place? It's really important to have this during our feature development process because we're going to be interviewing customers who are actually using our product, which will give us a ton of insights that normally can be hidden. We worked on a lot of products where we don't, um, where folks don't talk to their users, so they don't get to see those hidden insights, and that's a really big thing. We want to talk to them, see how they're using the product, what they're saying and doing might be two different things. We're going to spend time with them during these observation sessions during our audit to really observe and see and analyze how folks are going about doing things and what they're expecting. You might find a bunch of issues that's going to help address usability and accessibility in our product, which is really going to help enhance the inclusivity of our product as well. You might identify reusable patterns. We're going to engage with our design system a little bit more, help avoid those inconsistencies that's slowing down our development team or creating a confusing interface that's causing issues with our users and our customers. Because, you know, maybe we've been developing everything screen by screen and we're not really looking at things holistically across the board. Okay, so how do we go about fitting those in? Well, there's really two different things we need to figure out first is the size and scope of our audit, right? There's two types of audits that normally we do. Um, and a lot of folks will do. There's the larger audit. This is a great fully comprehensive audit of your entire product. Um, this will take a lot of time, a lot of resources to get done. This might align with a product revamp or uh, an entire feature set revamp or a rebranding of your product. The thing that we like to focus on the most is micro-sized audits. Um, these can be easier to include with your current process and really make that impact faster because it's something that you can do tomorrow. So let's really uh, dive into these and take a look at them. Now, for example, if you're doing a continuous discovery model, and we have a whole video series that kind of goes over this a little bit, um, we can really think about when we would put the audits in that process, right? We've identified our metric or our key KPI that we want to change, and we're going to start looking at the customer data and feedback. You know, this could be reviews, this could be things our customer service team had saw and um, has seen and has dealt with. Uh, backlog tickets or bugs that customers identified. We'll take that and we'll start to review our different screens and features that they're dealing with as well. We'll identify similar components and features that might um, that they might be using. 
we want to understand everything that this new feature, this new change is going to touch in our entire product. Um, and we might find potential issues right away, things that we can just immediately add to the backlog to fix. Then we're going to spend some time talking with our customers. And then when we identify the opportunity there, we're going to see if our assumptions from that first audit and some of those leading indicators are true. Is this really an issue that our customers are dealing with? Maybe the interviews reveal that it's not, or maybe the interviews revealed something completely new and we're going to go back through our continuous discovery loop um, and we might commit to doing an audit again. If time is an issue and you might not do the first one, and that's okay. During that customer data feedback, you might do not start your audit there. You might wait until after you do a customer interview. It's really up to you on how you want to implement this. Now, if you're doing a full product revamp, a revision of a feature set, or you've just never looked at your product holistically, you're going to really follow a similar approach. Except it might be a little bit more linear because we're not going to be looping through that maybe discovery loop. Uh, we want to consult with our customers just like we normally would in that discovery loop, observe how they're using the product, and evaluate those similar feature sets. But here, we might not be coming back through again. We might just keep going on and start working on that feature, start working on that revamp. Now that we kind of know how to fit them in, size and scope, like how do we go about doing the UX audit? There's a couple of steps along the way. We're going to kind of walk through each one of those steps. One of the first things we want to do is we want to establish our team. You know, is this a design only audit or is it a cross-functional audit? We might be including developers and product. If we are including developers and product, we might be looking at more than just the UX. This might be a comprehensive product audit. We might be doing code reviews. Uh, we might be diving deeper into our data modeling. We might be working with product on messaging and maybe targeting all at the same time. Now, for the rest of this talk, we're going to assume that this is like a design-led or a design-only audit, but just know that there are more expansive audits that can be done, and it's good to do those things all together as well. The next thing I want to do is really take a look at our research that we've done previously and see if any of that changes by going through and doing empathy map, reviewing our customer journey. Hopefully you have some of this data from previous research, uh, but it's always good to review. When we get to our interviews, we might find new nuggets of information and make some adjustments here, right? Our products are changing, our customer needs are changing, things are going to be a little bit different. So we want to go through and start with this empathy map, start with the journey and map out and see if any of that stuff has changed. While we're doing that, we're also going to take a look high level at either the feature or the product that we're revamping and taking a look at this audit. And we want to start mapping it out. This could be a full site map if you're doing an audit of like, let's say a marketing site. Uh, it could be a specific feature flow that we're mapping out and how um, the data transitions through that feature or the actions a customer is going to be taking through that feature. Uh, we want to see how things connect. Do they logically make sense? Are all the things in the right order what they should be, all the steps that we need to take? Are the like loops and re-engagement opportunities all functioning in there effectively? Um, we can also start slapping some stickies on here and some customer interview notes as we're going through those sessions. Hey, at this spot, users are getting stuck. They didn't catch maybe um, that the call to action was, you know, it was unclear, so they just didn't catch it. And we can start putting some of that information right here on the sitemap and start gathering some of our insights. Like I said, we're gonna be doing customer interviews and observations. Uh, we'll be looking for various flaws in the product. You know, frustrations our customers might be experiencing, but we're also looking for things that, you know, they express maybe a little bit of joy about or things that they, they like. Um, we wanna see like, are the interactions and patterns consistent as they're going through those? Have they created any workarounds for things that might not be, um, fixing or might not be addressing the thing that they're actually trying to accomplish. Are there any features they might request? Uh, this is a image from our report template and the, we summarize these things, pull out some high level quotes and we color code these as well in this coding system we use for our entire report template. Um, we like to call it things that they like, you know, they really like the overall feel, the color really stands out, things like that. We also want to color our code things like things that should be fixed, so our orange, red are things that absolutely need to be fixed. And blue are things that like, hey, there's some ideas. You know, somebody might pull out, hey, I really like this specific feature from this product. I wish it was in here. I want to take a look at that as well. 
So I'm going to start capturing these notes, and we might be putting those in our flow map or capturing them in a, in a format like this. We also might record all those interviews and take those recorded interviews and condense those into sort of like a highlight reel that we can have for our stakeholder presentation. Another thing we want to cons start doing is taking screenshots of all the different uh, flows and all the different screens in our product, maybe of our different components. And we want to start putting those into a tool for our team to leave notes and feedback on those as well. Uh, so we'll put those in tools like Miro or Figma or FigJam, a place where we can connect things, draw lines on it, sketch and doodle, put our ideas in little notes or what our customers are saying about specific screens. Um, what a place for us to take our notes. Sometimes it might look like, you know, you see the, uh, they call it the conspiracy board. It might look like a conspiracy board after a while, but you'll have all your different pieces and parts in there. And you might see inconsistencies by just looking at everything here at this high level and throwing these uh, snapshots in there, especially when you get into like a component audit. Maybe you're looking at your design system. Over on the right, you'll see all these different types of buttons, all these different call to actions, and like, oh, maybe we should unify some of these. Maybe we've built some inconsistencies because we're not using design system. This could be a good call to action to go build out a design system or implement that. Another thing we want to take a look at is leveraging object-oriented UX. One of the biggest things we unfortunately do as product teams and, and designers is we build things screen by screen. Um, this can remove us from thinking about the objects and how they function or are displayed across different areas of our product. Uh, this is an example from Eventbrite. You can see how this card and page header have some of the same information, but it displays it differently, and remixes it, potentially causing uh, continuity issues when somebody clicks on something from the home page where that smaller card is, and then they get the larger page, and they're like, oh, hey, where, where's the date? It was called out at the top. It was bright and red. Now it's not here anymore. Um, if you want to dive deeper into object-oriented UX, uh, Sophia Prater has got a ton of great stuff on it. Um, so definitely check that out. But this is something that we can incorporate in our UX audits as well. While we're going through our UX audit, one of the things that we want to have is like a great checklist. What are the set of rules and parameters where you're um, referencing as we're going through our audit criteria? Uh, this is crucial when we're going through it. And we have a free guide that you can download. That's kind of our checklist that we go through. And we sort of break things up into like interface and UI, where we're looking at like design and typography. Or like, for example, here's some forms and text fields. Is a form intent clear or communicative? Let's check every form through our product, make sure that it is clear to communicate what its purpose is. Why is this even there? Are they grouped by intent and context? Are we leveraging good spacing and um, contextualization by the way we place things in, the, in our forms? Take a look at accessibility, patterns in UX. Are we using consistent patterns across the board? Um, if we are having tables in a product that's very data centric, are all our table patterns consistent every time a table shows up? Is it a responsive web app? How does that handle on all the different devices? Checking for that. And then just functionality across the board is all the functionality consistent in every place in our product uh, where we have specific call to actions and things like that. Like I said, this is part of our uh, downloadable guide. Uh, so definitely go check that out. It's a great checklist um, and we'll continually be adding to it as we add more things to our UX audit process. After we go through all of that, we want to really report our findings. You know, we want to take everything that we've learned, everything that we've heard and put them together in a nice deck and have all of our key takeaways um, put together in sort of nice bite size and digestible information. When we build our reports, we like to have it kind of start with the high level things that we've identified. So high level things that are good, high level things that need to be fixed, need improvement ideas across categories like UX, like UI, like accessibility. And then the further we get into the presentation, the deeper we dive into it. So we will kind of high level talk about, hey, tab structure and controls are very confusing. 10 different people said there was an issue with it. And then we'll go into a screen where we have some of those detailed flow and notes. So stakeholders sometimes don't have a lot of time to get into the details. So if they only get through the first maybe five slides of the deck and they're like, that's great, let's go fix all this stuff. Let's jump over to uh, what's going to take to get it done. They might not need to dive into all those details. However, if they want to dive in those details, part of our report, we want to have those available as well. These detailed flow notes, 
uh, we want to report all of our findings and leverage some of those screenshots that we've captured before to anchor some of those initial thoughts uh, in our report. So for example, we might have issues with the setting page. Here is an example of a settings page. We might identify a whole bunch of stuff on this page. We might pull different screenshots from across the product that might address a single pattern and pull those in and say, hey, our um, table pattern, you know, I mentioned table before, uh, we have dynamically adjusting tables or um, dynamic field filtering, and it's not consistent across the board. So we'll pull those into a specific page here. Then we want to unpack the perceived severity of these issues. We'll leave notes on things that are good, things that need improvement, things that absolutely need to be fixed, and ideas. And like I said before, we could even have a link to a video highlight of users going through that process or um, interview snapshots going through this process and communicating how they feel about those things. Then like any good report, we want to be proactive when we approach our stakeholders, and we want to put all the information and everything that we think we should do to get these things addressed and do sort of an action plan, right? We want to talk about, hey, we want to address these must fix, must, must fix issues first, and then things that need to be improved, and then new concepts that we want to add. How long is it going to take us? What is the total effort going to be? Uh, this is all in our report template, but it's always good to be proactive and saying, hey, we can get all this addressed in the next six weeks. Here's everything that we identified and we'll go through those things. Um, this is a major pain point when going through a UX audit because a lot of times folks will go through UX audit and they might not create this action plan. And so there's a lot of time that gets used trying to figure out what to do next. So spending a little time thinking about how you could address all this stuff and planning it out is gonna be really helpful for your stakeholders. Now there's a lot of stuff here feel free to remix this. I think that's the biggest thing with like UX audits and reporting. There might be different things that you might add. You might not record videos and put a highlight reel together, or you might pull in a different uh, process. For example, we talk a lot about the Moscow process of must have, should have, could have, would have. You might do that ahead of time with your action plan. There's different things you can add that's really gonna be effective for you and your team, but you really need to understand how that functions for your team and how to execute as a team. Now we understand there's a ton here. So we've created a couple of resources to help people get started doing UX audits. Um, so if you go on the Figma community, we have uh, things like our app mapping and customer journey templates. Uh, we have our UX audit uh, template on there as well. So you can you do that as well. We also have a report template available in the community. All of those are kind of used in our UX audit process. Um, and we also have a free guide that kind of goes through the steps of creating your UX audit and really putting all of the comprehensive checklist in there um, and all different tools and plugins that we might have. Well, thank you all. I hope this will help empower you and your team to really like execute X UX audits and hope it makes sense like when to implement them and how to kind of go through it all um, and really how to prepare this information and present it out to your stakeholders. Um, so thanks again. Uh, we should have some time for questions. All right. First question. Um, I know you, I think you brought this up earlier in the presentation, uh, but will it be William caught us in the middle? Um, but when is a good time to bring up a UX audit? Yeah, we personally, like when we're working through our feature development process, for example, we've got an existing product, we're working on new features and we've got, um, we might be planning out our roadmap for a new feature kickoff. We like to do a that micro audit right away because we want to understand what is this new feature going to impact across the entire product or what might be changing to a feature across the entire product. So doing those smaller audits all the time kind of saves us from doing that big larger audit every once in a while where there's a lot to unpack. And it kind of follows into that continuous um, improvement and continuous discovery loop because we're doing those micro audits all the time. So every time a new feature is design is happening, that's a good time to take a quick comprehensive look of everything that's going to touch and finding those inconsistencies and starting to address those. Awesome, for sure. I'm right, just going to change up the view here. Um, great question, William. Thank you so much. Uh, so we got one from Brian, uh, oops, there we go, from Brian R. How do you deal with stakeholder disagreements to performing audits? So getting, getting buy-in. Buy-in can be tough. That can be a hard one to get uh, folks to really see the value of, of doing an audit. Um, 
there is a good thing right off the bat to do is if you get some time to do some user interviews on having folks walk through and doing an observation of going through your product, um, that might create enough leading indicators or enough data. Hey, we talked to 10 people, seven people had issues doing this, or they created their own manual workaround to do this. That might create enough data to be like, hey, we should really audit this whole process because we've identified this. And user interviews can happen really effectively um, so or really quickly. So, I mean, you could gain, hopefully, if you got a, a pretty big base, you can get 10 user interviews done, maybe a half an hour of time and get that all wrapped up in a week and then present that back to your stakeholders so that you can then perform maybe that larger audit or really start to dive into that audit process. Cool. Awesome. We got next question here. Hello, Taryn. How's it going? Uh, Taryn asks, how much of the things one should implement from the UX audit? Looking at timeline, you know, changes with development. So, hey, you found all this stuff in the UX audit. But like, how do you kind of figure out like when to do things and why? Yeah, absolutely. So there's two different ways. Like we're going to put together sort of our action plan and what we think it's going to take. And we might do that independently from our, our dev team. We might do that independently of our product owners, or we're going to do that together. And we're going to go through and prioritize everything. And we're going to have to be, as product designers, we have to be okay that not everything's going to get addressed and all the things that we want to get fixed are maybe not going to get fixed right away. But hopefully we're going to pull out together, hey, we're going to prioritize maybe these three things to get addressed in this sprint because we're working in this um, area right away. These other things might get backlogged and we're going to review those when we do like a backlog grooming session. Um, so we just want to really prioritize that either ourselves or as a group and understand like what is an absolute thing that needs to be adjusted. And there are some things that might just be like timeline exploders, right? They're just going to blow up an entire timeline. And that might get put on a backlog because, you know, we don't just have the time to do that. Um, but having that information, we can understand the things that need to come up. And maybe there's little micro steps we can take to get some of that stuff addressed and fixed. Awesome. Cool. We're going to the next one. Brian also asks, is there a rough uh, amount of time or rough, low, medium, high for the amount of time it takes? Yes, yeah, so I guess, like, how do you go about estimating how much time it takes to do an audit. I'm, I'm assuming there's probably just like some scope research for that. Yeah, so like I, like I said, like depending on how much of the process you wanna take and use or how much you don't, right? Like getting, um, during the discovery impact, we might be doing a micro audit at the beginning, then talking to users and observation sessions, then talking and then doing another little audit afterwards. Right, that could take a week, depending on how expansive the feature is. That could take two weeks, depending on how expansive the feature is. Right, it could take a little bit of time. We might drop a part of that out of there. Uh, we might not review something because um, because we just don't have the time to do it. So I think the important thing is figuring out, like, hey, maybe I've got two weeks to get this audit done. And then thinking through like, what are the activities I can do to really be effective in those two weeks and create the biggest impact for my product team. Um, and some of that might be just user interviews with some recordings and then an action plan after that. You might not capture and go through and capture all the screenshots and take all the notes. You really need to figure out like which elements are gonna be the most impactful going forward. We kind of want to show everything you could potentially do, but even when we do audits on different client engagements or things that we're working on, we don't always uh, do every single one of those items. We'll kind of remix our tool belt based on time, feature demand, um, product size, scope. Yeah, awesome. This next question is like it's so perfect for you because I don't think uh, I don't think she knows your your, your full background. Uh, Harshal asks, any suggestion for UX audit in gaming? Yeah, it depending on. So I used to work in the game industry, and we used to do a lot of uh, a lot of. I mean, we didn't call it auditing; we called it user testing or uh, play testing. And it's a similar process, right? We're looking through. Um, we might give our players specific challenges or specific things we're asking them to do and observing, can they easily find it? Can they actually get there? Did a certain percentage of our users get it? Gaming's a, a little bit different because everyone plays a game a little bit differently. They have different expectations, different backgrounds. So it's a lot more, I would say, user-focused um, where in a, in a product audit, we can take some assumptions by knowing best practices and things like that. 
but depending on like what the intent behind our game is, the intent behind our level, uh, you know, it's going to be contextual. Like a horror survival horror game is going to have a different set of criteria than like a first person shooter action Call of Duty style game. Uh, so it'll be a lot more player focused. Awesome. I was like, that's such a cool question. I don't think we've ever gotten any like gaming uh, questions before. So. Cool. All right. Brian's coming in with another one. Thanks, Brian. Keep, keep them coming. Do you leverage analytics to identify pain points within the user experience? Absolutely. So if we have things already set up, like different tooling, um, different observation sessions, uh, observation tools, things like log seek, where we can actually watch user sessions. Uh, we might be observing cart flows and actually seeing how people are checking through a cart and where are they missing an opportunity? What's the fall off rates, things like that. Um, a lot of that stuff, if it's already implemented, that's great. If it's not implemented, then we have to try to like work around that a little bit. Um, but yes, if, if a, if a team has analytics and tooling already put into place, it's always a good data point. The thing that's hard with some of the raw just data stuff is sometimes we don't get the answer to why necessarily. We just know people are falling off. And so we still have to end up talking to people or watching some observation sessions, uh, which are super powerful because then we can see like, what are they actually doing that's causing this fall off or what's causing them not to enter in a promo code or something like that. All right, off to the next one. Taryn's back with another one. Is there a good audit handoff for developers? So I'm assuming from design to development, yeah. Absolutely, so I think when we're putting together our comprehensive audit and we're thinking through all of the adjustments and changes that we wanna make and the improvements that we wanna make is really going through and breaking those down into what we feel is the most important thing to do and then spending time to talk to our developers what's the implementation um, impact on some of these things right we showed that collage of all those call to action buttons and we could just come in as a designer or a product team and say we need a design system um, that's a huge implementation thing right the develop dev team design team that's going to be a lot of work and a lot of effort to get that done uh, so that might not be the right choice for us to go with right there and then we want to talk to our dev team and really understand their timeline and work with them on that handoff. We're going to put sort of what we think is the most important in the timeline, what we think we can do to fix it on the design side. But we definitely want to have that conversation with our team because our timelines might be different. They're almost guaranteed to be different. All right, cool. I don't see any more questions coming through, um, but we'll hang out for a couple more minutes. Otherwise, we'll wrap things up. Um, but yeah, thanks, Billy, for all, all your sharing all your expertise today and, and uh, answering all the questions. Um, yeah, it's just, it's been fun to get all the kind of uh, unique perspective questions here, especially like the analytics question, uh, it, how it applies to gaming. I think it's been a pretty fun discussion today. So, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and yeah, just a reminder, like, check out our free resources. If you got any uh, feedback, on anything we put out there, you know, we're always looking to make sure that we've got the best stuff um, out there for folks and, and really best practices. So any notes or anything that you've, um, you have on our resources, definitely just email me directly or send that note to Jacob. Uh, we're excited to continually update all of that stuff. Yeah, I would say like, you know, whether it's, um, it just simply adding a comments on either this video or other videos that we have on our channel I read those and it can reply and it's like, a, we want to know like what other topics you all want to learn about from our team, whether it's from Billy or anyone else on, on the Headway Design team. Um, we'd love to know like what you want to learn from us. Um, otherwise, you can just head to our website. Like Billy said, we have a general contact form in the footer. Um, but also, yeah, check out the resources. Um, lot, we have so many free resources on Figma community. It's pretty crazy. <laughs> um, and uh, we're just really, really proud of, of the things that we're sharing. So, and we're glad that like the feedback's been very positive so far, whether it's through email or, or YouTube comments or and stuff like that. It's been really cool to hear. Taryn says, design tokens, please. <laughs> nice. Yeah, we do need to make a video about design tokens. We have a great blog post about design tokens, Billy. You already have the outline made basically for the video. <laughs> for sure, so, well, for sure. Yeah, well, I don't see any more questions, so I think we can wrap it up. Uh, usually we could go for about an hour, but uh, I think 30 minutes is a good good time to stop too, though. So thanks again, Billy, and uh, for, for sharing all your expertise today. And thanks to everyone for, for joining us and participating and supporting everything we're doing. 
and yeah, thanks, Brian. Yeah, I think we appreciate your support. So um, awesome. Well, everybody have a great day and uh, just let us know if you need anything and take care.